background the conversation about annexation, and I'm not particularly sure that we want to go there because we have a much more exciting program today. Not only, not only do we have the Washington County Cooperative Library System Executive Director here with us, and I'm going to turn over the mic in just a few moments to Eva, but Eva, wait, I said it's pronounced Empress. It's pronounced Empress. So thank you very much, Mr. Executive Director. Who serves at the pleasure of the board? Um, <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> we will be going today. You know, after the program, there'll be a, time for questions. Questioners will have to be a paid-up forum member to ask questions. Questions will come from over there. And about ten to one, we're going to sneak in another program. I'm not going to tell you yet what it is, but we're going to have just a few minutes. You might consider it a shaky idea, but I think it's a real important one. Ladies and gentlemen, Eva Calgano from the Library System. and I'm the director of Washington County Cooperative Library Services and I've worked for the cooperative for 25 years Yay. which was a fast 25 years because I can't be that old <laughs> I'm here today to talk to you about uh, measure 34 235 which is a levy for countywide library services which will be on your November 3rd ballot and I understand that last week you had a presentation by our County Sheriff Rob Gordon and District Attorney Bob Herman, and they also have a measure on the ballot 34236, which is a renewal of the countywide public safety levy. And first, let me say, while those two lovely gentlemen are elected officials, they are allowed by by state law to advocate for their measures. I, as a lowly humble public servant, um, am controlled by ORAS to say that I must provide you with neutral factual information. So I will try to curb my enthusiasm when I talk about library <laughs> service. Um, but you may feel free to share as you will. Um, <laughs> public library service in Washington County is brought to you uh, through a partnership. And for 39 years, the Washington County Cooperative Library Services um, has been in place to provide public library service to every county resident. And it includes Washington County, as well as nine cities and two nonprofit associations that provide public library service. And that includes the cities of Banks, Beaverton, Cornelius, Forest Grove, Hillsboro, North Plains, Sherwood, Tigard, and Tualatin. And two nonprofit libraries are Cedar Mill Community Library and the Garden Home Community Library. And the county actually runs only one public library outlet, and that's the West Slope Community Library. And in this partnership, the county, or my office, we do three primary things. We are the primary funding source for public library operations in the county. So the majority of our budget, about 75 to 80% of our budget, is distributed annually to our member libraries to support their operating costs. Uh, the second thing we do is provide support services to our member libraries. And those include things like the shared library catalog, free internet access at our member libraries, courier deliveries between buildings, and so forth. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then the third thing we do is provide outreach to special populations. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with their outreach to homebound program, where we mail materials for free to people who are homebound and can no longer get to a public library. That's an example. So while the county doing these things in this partnership, it leaves our member libraries to provide direct patron service. And that's what they do, and that's what you probably recognize when you think about public library service. So the question um, is, how is the cooperative library services funded? Well, we are an office of county government. Um, about two-thirds of our funding comes from the county's general fund. So it's part of the general fund tax base. But one third of our funding comes from a local option levy, uh, which and the current levy is set to expire in June of 2016. Um, on average, uh, WCCLS provides about 64% of our local library operating budgets. The balance of that funding comes from their, maybe their city general fund support or fundraising, fines and fees, grants, a very, very small amount of state funding for public libraries. So for example, I'll use Beaverton as an example. About 60% of the Beaverton operating budget are county dollars, 40% local dollars. 
So that means the current levy makes up 20% of the Beaverton Library budget. Measures 34 to 35 would replace that um, expiring levy with a, a levy for an additional five years. So that would run through 2021. What would the measure do? Um, first, it would maintain library and libraries and branches that serve all county residents. So it would allow our current member libraries to maintain open hours, services, programs, collections, um, and uh, provide a level of funding that allows them to operate that through the next five years. Um, we'd increase uh, the funding a little bit in the first year to adjust for changes that have happened over the last five years and then provide a small uh, annual increase to our member libraries to allow them to keep up with cost increases. Additionally, um, some of our member libraries will plan to op increase their open hours at some of the libraries and those that I know about or are talking about that include banks, Garden Home, North Plains, and Tiger Libraries. The levy will add basic operating support for new and expanded libraries, and that includes the addition of a Loa Community Library as a full member library, and that might be relevant to this group in particular. Um, so a Loa Community Library could, would become a full uh, participant in WCCLS. They would be added to our library catalog. Um, residents could pick up and deliver materials, uh, pick up and return materials at a Loa library throughout, from throughout the countywide system. They'd receive support for uh, programming, summer reading programs, those kinds of things. Also, we have two libraries, Cornelius Public Library and the Bethany branch of Cedar Mill Community Library that are looking to increase the size of their current um, facilities, either in that facility or very close by in a larger facility. So expand the services available in those two communities. And then the city of Hillsborough is looking to open one or two new branches as that city um, grows in particular areas, South Hillsborough or Amber Glen, for example, and they're looking at as the population in those areas are built out, they would add branches there. So the levy would allow us to plan for um, basic operating support so as those libraries come online, we're able to support that. Most of you probably know that a uh, uh, major um, service libraries provide is children's reading programs. And countywide, our member libraries have over 280,000 child visits a year. Those are both children who come into the library to attend reading programs, story times, summer reading. There are also children who are um, reached through outreach efforts of our, our member libraries and through central support staff. So people who are visiting classrooms, preschools, child care centers, migrant camps, um, summer free lunch programs, other kinds of activities where we go out into the community to try to reach children where they are, knowing that every child can't always get to the library um, to attend programs. Um, and when we talk about children's programs, we really focus on two main uh, age areas. The first is the early literacy piece, which are um, services for children aged zero to six. So before they enter school, looking at early literacy, pre-literacy, um, exposure to books and letters and numbers and colors and shapes and si seasons and uh, other kinds of concepts so that when they enter school, they are ready to read and they are ready to learn. Um, and that's how we support uh, our school systems um, and assure that it, m as many children as possible are ready to go and they have the skills they need to start. Um, we also want to increase our literacy training in English and in Spanish to develop reading skills in children. An example of this um, is a program that the WCCLS Outreach started in June of this year, which is a, called Books for Kids, and it's an outreach program, we deliver uh, bins of books to home-based child care providers in um, areas that have been identified for us by community action organization as providers in areas of high need. So they're in school catchment areas where there's a high percentage of low-income children, children who will be part of the free lunch program, a high percentage of English language learners. So we really target at-risk in high need areas, and we deliver materials to those home-based childcare providers 
and provide some training to those child care providers to help them incorporate literacy into the care of the children. Um, and it's, I think, about half of the uh, providers in the first group are uh, Spanish-speaking or bilingual homes. So we're working really hard to reach the highest need children and get them uh, hooked on books um, early on and on those literacy concepts so that they uh, enter preschool and kindergarten and first grade ready to go. But we don't just stop there. Libraries also focus then on school-age children. So like elementary, middle, high school children and looking at enhancing reading programs um, that keep kids reading, especially over the summer or during long school breaks. Um, I will say that this last summer, we had 22% of the children in Washington County aged zero to 17 registered for summer reading programs. So we reached 22% of the children in this county. Um, it's a very important activity for them to keep their minds active, to keep their academic skills honed so that when they return in September to school, um, they can pick up where they left off. Um, we are also looking with this levy to uh, increase our ability to support homework help and tutoring support and we're looking at subscriptions to provide online homework assistance, to especially the elementary and middle school age children, the kids who can't drive to school to do their homework after school, um, and providing that online so that we can reach children who are at home and can't get to the library. Um, and that's an important piece of what we do to help uh, continue that academic uh, success part. Um, again, we're looking to package services to deliver to children where they are, knowing that they can't all come to us. Additionally, uh, the levy, of course, would allow our member libraries to maintain their collections. So the purchase of books, materials that are available at all libraries to all county residents. Um, we were looking to purchase current new materials that are shared across the system. WCCLS, my office, would increase our subscriptions for e-books and e-audio books. Uh, to address the increasing patron use of those new formats. And our goal is to respond to patron requests, uh, to reduce wait times, and to, for new materials especially, and to maintain our collection currency. And then, of course, I don't want to leave out lifelong learning. It's a, a part of what we do. So in addition to the early literacy and the school age kids, there are many of us who are lifelong learners uh, people who are coming to the library to learn new skills, to retool for the job market, um, or just to solve life problems. Uh, how to take care of those roses, how to build the deck, how to um, learn to use your new digital camera, those kinds of activities. And libraries offer workshops and things like computer skills and resume writing. We offer databases and online tools that help people who are uh, wanting to start a business or do market research. Um, we have over 375 public access computers across the county, uh, as well as offering free Wi-Fi. And I think we actually have more people who come into our libraries with their own device, whether it's a laptop or a tablet or even a, a smartphone now, and use our Wi-Fi to do their research uh, and other activities as we do people using our own the wired computers. Libraries also offer meeting space, which is important, especially to uh, small business people. You, the public library is a free, safe, neutral place where you can meet with clients, um, and we don't make you buy fancy coffee. <laughs> In addition, uh, the levy would support those central support activities that link our libraries together, and that includes our shared library catalog, our wccls.org website, um, we provide free internet to our member libraries for uh, productivity and to the public um, for using the internet. We offer Wi-Fi. We provide the database subscriptions for research databases and ebook subscriptions. We have courier deliveries um, seven days a week that pick up and deliver materials between libraries, either to fill patron requests or to return materials to their home locations. Um, and those folks pick up and deliver about 7.4 million items a year. So it's a very active um, interlibrary sharing program. We also provide uh, support for the countywide summer reading program. 
Our outreach services include mail delivery to people who are homebound, and they can either be in their home or in a residential care facility, and we will mail materials to them. We also have a limited delivery program where a staff person goes out to care facilities and delivers rotating collections. Um, we provide outreach to Spanish-speaking residents, really focusing on children and families in that case, um, and educating uh, residents, new residents, about the public library services and incorporating them and getting them plugged into the system. And we provide outreach to children in care, and I talked a little bit about the Books for Kids program that we started in June. Um, through the levy, we're also hoping to increase efficiencies uh, across the system in our service areas, and this includes things like um, expanding our group purchase of high demand or popular materials so that we reduce staff handling time and we get materials to people faster. We want to expand the WCCL's courier warehouse to increase its sorting capabilities uh, to move as we're moving materials in transit. Um, and we're looking to add an option for some off-site storage for our member libraries uh, to reduce the number of materials that must be withdrawn just because of space constraints. So now the, the dollars and cents piece. Uh, measure 34 to 35. It is proposed as a five-year levy. It would begin in July of 2016, replacing the expiring levy in June of 2016. It is a rate of 22 cents per $1,000 of assessed value, and that's an increase of five cents over the current rate. Um, if it is approved, it would be the first rate increase since 2006, or about 10 years. Um, for the average assessed value home in Washington County, cost would be a total of about $56 a year or $5 a month and the increase would be about $14 of that amount. Um, for a quick summary, what would that five cent increase buy? It would allow our member libraries to maintain their services. It would increase our annual distributions to member libraries to allow them keep, to keep up with uh, increasing costs. Some libraries would be able to add open hours to serve uh, county residents. We'd add basic operational support for a new library in Aloha and planned expansions in Cornelius, Bethany, and Hillsboro. We'd increase support for children's programs and services. We'd increase purchase of materials and ebooks, and we'd maintain our central support and outreach services that link our libraries together. Because the current levy is one third of our funding, um, if the proposed levy didn't pass, there would be reductions in service. I don't want to scare people or, or try to sound threatening or anything, but a third is a pretty big hole to fill. Um, so there would be reductions. It would be determined um, probably at the local level based on local service priorities, hours, that kind of thing. But residents would see some reductions in hours, purchases, and programs. In addition, there would, no, there would be no additional funding um, for our newer expanded libraries like Aloha or Cornelius or uh, Bethany. Mm -hmm. There's additional information on at your table. There's a rack card, a white card that's got the nuts and bolts of the measure on the, uh, of the measure for you. In addition, on our website, includes the ballot title and explanatory statement that will appear on your voters pamphlet, as well as a detailed FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions document that probably has more information than you'd ever want to know. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And people want to line up for questions again over to my right, please. And we'll take it away with the first question almost there. Yep, a member. Uh, last year I came upon your book sale and had so much fun I went back two days in a row. <laughs> but could you explain a little bit about what's in that sale and what it means to the public? Thank you, Emily. Uh, I think all of our member libraries have uh, used book sales and that's a, usually run by the Friends of the Library group. Um, and that's a, a key way that local Friends of the Libraries are 501c3 nonprofits that support their local libraries. 
So they, one of their key fundraisers are having used book sales. So these are, these are either materials that have been donated for the sale, or some, quite often they're things that have been withdrawn from the library and are no longer needed, extra copies of really popular materials that are no longer popular. Um, those are put together in a sale and that's a way to generate cash to buy new materials or to support programs or other activities. Um, and I'm trying to think if we have a list of book sales. We usually, if we know about them in advance, we will list them on our website. Um, there will be a news and events thing, but also pay attention at your local public library. They will have posters up, I'm sure. Um, also, many of our libraries sell things online. So um, you may um, be able to purchase materials. You may go to Amazon.com looking for a used book, and it may come from a library in Washington County or somewhere else, too. So that's a good way to generate money, but that's an all-volunteer effort that's uh, used to generate additional donations to support library operations. Thank you for Rob Solomon, um, forum member. Um, I have read recently that a lot of libraries nationwide, the utilization is going down and that they have uh, come up with some pretty creative ideas. One that I suggested to a library board member, never got much of an answer, is um, taking out people just like you would take out books. Or check that out person. Yeah. Right, to, that <laughs> person obviously would volunteer. I, I was interested in volunteering if they would take me out for dinner, but the idea would be to actually take out a book instead of a person. I was wondering if the county system is, it's kind of two part, needing or wishing to do something innovative, and two, if you're thinking about renting people. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, to the first statement, library use in Washington County, across the state, and across the nation, is changing um, for I'd say since I've been here for 25 years the first 20 years I was here it was all transaction driven checkouts 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 that that we were really a place where people would come in they'd check out a stack of books or videos and they'd bring them back three weeks later um, we still have a high level of circulation and Washington County is the second highest in Oregon and ranks um, fairly high as an aggregate uh, nationally in terms of circulation of checkout of materials. Um, use of print materials um, is kind of flat. Um, continuing though, use of e-materials, e e-books, e-audiobooks is on a very sharp trajectory up. Um, use of media, so checkouts of videos and CDs are declining fairly rapidly, I think, as many of us transition to Netflix and iTunes, and you can get that all on your phone now for free, so why would you wait for three months for the library to get that video? So that's just, it's just the way people use information and they use entertainment differently. Our use patterns are changing too, um, but our libraries are looking at how the services they provide in providing a, a much higher number of programs. Um, so more focusing more on conversation, on expertise. Um, SIG is a perfect example of someone who comes to our libraries and gives lectures and talks about uh, history. Um, so looking at programs for all ages, not just the children's reading programs, but adult programs, um, book talks, author visits, um, humanities discussions, how-to discussions, DIY kinds of activities, um, just a variety of ways people want to come to the library and learn about it because they it's kind of a neutral place uh, to be and they're not gonna get sold something um, as part of the, the presentation, but it's also a way to meet their neighbors, have a conversation uh, with folks from their community. Um, that's a big part of how our, our use is changing, so that's kind of a people way of of doing that. I don't know that any of us are checking out people yet. I'm looking at Abigail and Colleen. Um, but we are looking at a, a variety of things, and I'll use Hillsborough Library as an example. They've added what they call a, a library of things about a year ago, and they started checking out bakeware, cake pans and cupcake pans that look like Mickey Mouse or Darth Vader or Dora the Explorer because you know, we have the cookbooks, we've had cookbooks forever, but now we have the, the thing that you may only need once in your life, the apple pitter or the cherry pitter or the pressure cooker. Um, sewing machines, I saw a mom, a very pregnant mo mother and a toddler going out with a sewing machine and I thought she's gonna go home and make something for her children. And she may not want a sewing machine 
forever, but for three weeks she can sew something. Um, so that's an example of, of how our collections are changing. <laughs> Chris Leslie, board member, very good to see you, Eva. Thank you, Chris. My question deals with more of donations and what a great tax write-off it is. <clears throat> you should be stressing that too, I think. I'm sort of uh, cheap and I want to know what is, and you actually probably answered this because I could look it up on the web, what return you get on books you donate to the library system? I am looking at you guys. We will prop, hmm, what return we get on books. I mean, like I paid $29 for a book, what would my tax write-off be? I'm looking at you guys because they're they deal with book sales and people. Um, a donation of library of books to our library. So um, the libraries are not allowed to assign a value. We will give you a, a certificate or some kind of a receipt of donation, but you'd have to look it up on the IRS probably website to see the value of, of used materials. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will, while you brought that up, because we're talking about donating to libraries, I wanted to share a really amazing statistic with you, and that's the number of volunteers our member libraries have. The latest information they have available is for fiscal year 2013-14, and countywide there were 2,935 volunteers at our county libraries. Wow. And they donated 141,985,000 hours to our member libraries. So almost 142,000 hours. So in addition to the paid staff, uh, and the, the structure that we have, a lot of volunteer effort and love goes into running public libraries, and I just want to thank the volunteers who do that. Yes. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, for a member and circulation volunteer. And, uh, <laughs> Bethany and I'm on the uh, Cedar Mill Board, uh, and have very much enjoyed being involved in your countywide system. And it is, I think, extraordinary what you do in getting these materials across the county so rapidly and so and uh, so effectively. Uh, what I'm wondering about is, and I know you're not in a position to promote things, but uh, how would a person go about volunteering to assist in the promotion of the levy measure? That's a good question. And I will answer you factually. There is <clears throat> an advocacy group uh, that formed probably 40 years ago to support um, countywide levy efforts. It's called People for Libraries, PAC, um, and the director, Jean Butcher, the president, is here, and you can talk to Jean, or there are other members, uh, Harry Bodine's been involved for many, many years with that, and I would direct you to them, or their website, People for Libraries, Dot org. Okay, thanks, Jim. Hello, Eva. John McWilliams, forum member. Um, I'd like, I have a question uh, concerning the fact that we have a lot of growth in, in Washington County and uh, areas uh, that will be continue to be developed. Uh, South Hillsboro might be one of those. Uh, a lot of people are going to be moving into that area. I would think that uh, we have new libraries possibly coming on the line at some time. Uh, I just started a library now. How do I, what do I do to, get to become a part of Washington County Services? That's a good question. Um, and, and you're right, the county is growing and we're, um, we always are trying to look ahead, but that's kind of a crystal ball. But um, there are places uh, designated for growth. South Hillsboro is one of them. Um, South Beaverton and the River Terrace, is that what it's called? The Tiger Development that's just south of South Beaverton, um, where there uh, are projected to be growth of, of homes, especially in schools. Um, so WCCLS and our city um, partners try to keep in touch with what's happening in other departments. So what's, what are land use and transportation talking about? What are our school districts talking about? And how can we follow what they're doing so that we can try to be prepared and respond to the library needs of these new growth areas. 
Um, and then to answer your second part of your question, to become a member of WCCLS, um, because we are a cooperative, if um, there is a city, so for example, Beaverton City Library decided to open a branch in Murray Shoals about 2010. Uh, this decision was probably made earlier than that, but it opened in 2010. Um, because they're a current member library, we would work with them to incorporate that branch into the countywide system. If uh, a library is in an unincorporated area, for example, a Loa Community Library, um, one of their options is to form a nonprofit association to be the parent or the manager of that entity, and that's what Aloha did, similar to Cedar Mill and Gone <coughs> Home. Um, and then we have admission guidelines that the library works through over a, ser a period of time um, to prepare itself to be a full service member library. Um, and so, assuming this measure passes, then we would work closely with the Aloha Community Library folks to get them online, plugged in, connected, so that they're ready to go in the summer of 2016 um, to be a full member library. And then they would receive um, some a basic level of operational support from us as well. Harry will need for a member and uh, a very strong support of this levy, I might add. Even at the, uh, <clears throat> when our kids were going to school back in the 80s, late 70s, I think every elementary school in this county had a school librarian. My understanding is those people have virtually disappeared. And you covered some of the things we're doing, but are we really backfilling what the schools historically have done, in a sense? And that's a good question question, Harry, and I would say the short answer is no, we're not backfilling because there's no way we could, public libraries could backfill. The purpose of a school library or school library media center is to support the curriculum of that school. And so they do that in a very different way that's really focused on classroom projects, on reading projects, on the, is it fourth grade you study the Oregon Trail, and in fifth grade you study the states or something like that. I mean, there's an Oregon curriculum thing, and so those schools are really designed to have the depth and the type of materials that support those classroom projects. Um, you are right that um, over the last probably 20 years, probably since Measure 5, um, school library media folks have disappeared from every school district in the in the state, well, most districts in the state, mostly in Washington County. There are very few left. By law, I think they have to have one um, library uh, person, and those are often at the district office. And they direct paraprofessionals or volunteers to try to manage the local school library and the elementary or middle school kind of thing. Um, folks who might are part of the Beaverton School District might be very familiar with the recent um, levy measures and there has been a very ardent group of parents uh, that lobbied successfully to get the district to add library teachers back into the school buildings um, after eliminating all of them uh, due to the funding issues. Um, and that process, I think, began this school year and is folding out. Um, but I think it's really important that those folks are there to support the students in helping them connect with materials to provide the collections that are current and support the classroom activities, especially as we're switching from um, different kinds of uh, educational philosophy statewide um, and to help children become good information consumers. Um, in a knowledge economy, it's, it's really amazing that the person who's trained to teach people how to discern accurate information, correct information from all of the other stuff that you get on the internet. You can't just Google something and know that it's true. Um, but those are the people that got eliminated. I understand why the school districts did, because their resources were so limited and they had to focus on classroom bodies. And many of the school library people got moved into classrooms. Um, so they're still in the building, but they have another job now and they can't be doing this other school library thing. 
So I'm hoping that they, our school districts can continue that. We are working with our districts to say, here's what we as a public library system can offer, but we will not just replace it. You can't just say, go to the library, go to the public library after school, because we know a majority of children can't or won't get there. They're in the building all day long. That's where they need it. That's my pitch, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Careful, could be challenged. <laughs> Eric Swires, Executive Director. I'm wondering if you could touch upon two of the libraries that this group may not be um, very well as, uh, informed about. One would be the law library, the other one would be the library in the jail. And maybe you could, if you could talk about, are those funded by this levy? Are they statu statutory requirements? Uh, could you tell me a little sure. bit about those libraries that I find myself in far too often? In the jail library? No comment. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. Those are two county uh, managed libraries. The Washington County Law Library is next door to my office um, in, in Hillsboro. We do not provide funding for that. They're funded through, I think, court filing fees or some. There's some state a statute that defines how law libraries are funded, county law libraries. Um, but we cooperate with them in a couple of ways. One is they um, have some databases, that legal databases that they want to make available to the legal um, community in Washington County. And so they do that through our county website because it's easy to find and it's available in libraries and to the public from home, office, school, et cetera. So we host those for them to provide that service to their uh, clientele. Um, we also allow, they have a very limited checkout of materials, they've had red bags and they check things out to attorneys and attorneys can then drop that red bag off at any public library and we'll get it back to the law library for them through our courier, just to facilitate that so an attorney doesn't have to drive from Sherwood back to Hillsborough to return a book, we'll do that for them. Um, the, there is a library, an inmate library in the Washington County Jail, it's um, part of the county, the jail education program, so it's supervised in that structure. And the jail takes a very um, strong, makes a very strong commitment to um, educating people while they are in jail, while they're being held there. And I think they issue more GEDs, I'm speaking off the top of my head, but I think they issue more GEDs annually than uh, the school districts do. So their goal is to educate and give people something that when they get released, they have a skill and they have a credential that they at least have the tools to not just go back to what they were doing before they got them into the jail. Um, so we have a partnership with the Sheriff's Office. Um, the Cooperative Library Services provides the book budget for that. So we provide a bit of budget. They're, they're county residents, they're homebound of sense. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we, they are. <laughs> we work with the sheriff's office to do that, and they provide the staff and the supervision, and we provide the book budget. So, do you pay rent there? No. Nope. You just. Uh, it's part of the jail structure. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Great coloring books there. Thanks for that. <laughs> Eva, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and for answering the questions. Thank you. presentations, I learned a lot from questions. As a matter of fact, if I may, to our board member, Chris Leslie, I would point out that donations, nothing against the library, but donations to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum are also tax deductible. Thank you. He made me do that. He made me do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for just a few moments that we have left, I guess we're really excited. We're having you know, membership drives, we're getting new members, we're getting old members coming back, and one of our former members is here today with a really important message. If I may, I'd like to ask Sig Unander to come up and take the mic. Welcome back, Sig. <laughs> I want to add that uh, another great service of your Washington County Public Library is that they have a reference line that you can call in, even if you're at home, don't have to come into the library, get an answer to your question. As an author, I've used that on a number of occasions, even when I couldn't get out. 
I can still call the library. Not everything is on the internet, so there are materials and stuff that a good reference library that will never be replaced can get for you. So another great reason to support your local Washington County Cooperative Library service. Five bucks a month, can't beat it. How many people here read the New York Times article on the upcoming Cascadia subduction earthquake? Two, three, four, five. Thank you. It's interesting the effect that that has had on our uh, our collective awareness of the upcoming Cascadia subduction quake because there was absolutely no new information in that whatsoever. It's all been known by geologists for over 20 years and yet uh, for some reason it struck a chord nationally and we've been doing quite a bit of earthquake preparation lately for it. The Washington County uh, Community Planning Organizations, your extension service at OSU, Washington County and a group of small, small group of citizens are preparing a great event for you this coming Saturday. It's called Quake Up and it will be the first county-wide earthquake preparation event in Washington County. I would like you all to come. It's important because if we're not ready for this, the results, or I should say the outcome, could be catastrophic. A major Cascadia subduction earthquake up, say, 9.5 to 9.3 could have a devastating effect similar to that of Chile in 1960 or Tokyo in 1923 where 142,000 people unfortunately were killed in the subsequent fire or San Francisco or closer to home 1906 3,000 people killed in about uh, today's estimates about 5 billion in property damage and um, basically a change in the economy so San Francisco never was the biggest city west of the Mississippi after that it became Los Angeles we would not like to have to see Microsoft, Intel, Nike leave the Northwest or our economy devastated. Therefore, we need to prepare for this, both on a corporate level and a civic level with our infrastructure, um, our businesses secured, our buildings, our schools, our excuse me, retirement facilities, for our medically elderly and fragile people but also our homes. What can you do that costs virtually nothing but gets you started immediately on a plan to safety? Securing your home, making a plan for exit, or to stay in your home so you can, um, well, I was gonna say age in place. That's not the, quite the phrase I was looking for. <laughs> so that you can, you can stay in place, tie your home down to the foundation, uh, anchor your water heater so that you don't have to go to uh, live in a tent or go to a refugee facility in the event of an earthquake, a major one. We want people to stay safe. There's no reason that we have to panic or be scared. We can all get the information we need to prepare. So I would urge you to come to the Hillsborough Civic Center on Saturday, beginning at nine o'clock, going all the way to three o'clock. We will have a nationally recognized expert on earthquake preparation. Dr. Spencer Rubin will be there. We'll have a presentation in Spanish for Spanish speakers. We are going to have a pass to safety and stuff you can take home to get started right now on preparing your home for earthquake safety. We'll also have uh, children's games and prizes for kids in the Washington County Museum right next door to the Civic Center. Uh, we'll have a presentation in the auditorium at about 16 booths of different kinds where you can sign up to win prizes and get on mailing lists and take home a lot of literature that will help you get ready and stay safe. So with that pitch, do you have any questions? I'm leaving posters for everybody in the back there. Uh, you can pick one up and take it home. I hope you will. Right now, do we have any questions? Oh, sure. Okay. When, when the uh, Port of Portland people were here, they were talking about the Hillsborough Airport and presuming. Can you get closer to the mic? It's not working. Can everybody hear her? No. Here, then what we're going to do is borrow it. Borrow it. Hi. Thank you. Um, when the Port of Portland people were here, they were saying the improvements to the Hillsborough Airport were necessary because they presume, in case of earthquake, all of the bridges from the east side to the west side will go down. And we will be the sole airport that they can get supplies in and out of. Is there anything in particular west side people need to do that east side people don't need to do? East side meaning east of the Cascades or east of the Willamette? Willamette. <laughs> yes, well, first of all, you should know that the uh, 
which the ground that most of our gasoline and fuel supplies were built on along the Willamette River will liquefy. I got a good voice. <coughs> and test one, two, I'm, I'm going dead here. There we go. So that there will not be any gasoline. What you have stored in your cars will have to uh, be suffice for at least a month, possibly a lot longer. Um, the Hillsborough Airport has a fairly hardened runway. You can put a heavy aircraft on it. It's thought that probably the heavy uh, supplies and equipment we need will be flown in to the Redmond Airport, uh, which is a good long hard surface air, uh, runway, at least a mile long. And then they'll, they'll be somehow airlifted by helicopter or small aircraft to Hillsborough, which hopefully will still remain usable. FEMA trucks will not be coming across the Willamette River or across the Columbia River because those wonderful bridges will be down or the supports and approaches to them will be shattered. So uh, plan to be on your own for quite a while. Next question. Would you hand in the My mic, please? My name is Chris Leslie, and I am a forum member. Other than scaring everybody, why is this important? I'm the ringer. <laughs> I thought you were going to be my shield, Chris. I was. Why is it important? Yes. Because we have an opportunity. Remember the old liquid plumber commercial in the 60s? You, you can pay me now or you can pay me a lot later. This is literally true. It costs far more to repair a broken, busted infrastructure and save lives and treat people medically after than it does to prepare for. It's a, this is an investment. Think of it as an investment in safety and your property. If you have earthquake insurance on your house and it's tied down to the foundation, uh, your house can be rebuilt. If it slides off the foundation, it could be a total financial loss that could wipe you out. These are things one needs to think about. I know that's sobering, but these are all part of the package of earthquake preparation. That's a lot of P's. Good alliteration. Package of earthquake preparation that we all should learn to be aware of and that you can get when you come to Wake Up this Saturday at 9 o'clock in the Hillsborough Civic Center. Is that a clear enough pitch? Clear. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that comes, brings our program to a close. Next week, we have Pam Treese from the West Side Economic Alliance discussing her organization and cementing our relationship as we continue to develop partners. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We'll see you next Monday. Bye.